So, remember this uh, stunning quotation from Eugene Peterson. By the way, uh, does that name mean something to you, the message? You've got it here, I'm sure, don't you? How many have read the message? Nobody? Ooh, it's a wonderful, fresh translation. Um, if you're interested in looking it up on the YouTube, uh, there's an interview between Bono. Do you know who Bono is? In U2, okay? Between Bono and Eugene Peterson. Now, Eugene used to be a professor at Regent. And one day, Bono came to Regent and tried to look up Eugene Peterson because he so appreciated Eugene's translation of the Psalms. And he put a note on the door, uh, Sorry, I missed you, Eugene Bono. And when Eugene came back, he said, Who's Bono? <laughs> and the student said, You mean you don't know who Bono is? And Bono was here and you didn't see him? And so the interview is really fun. You can look it up on the YouTube uh, because it's an interview between Bono and Eugene about the Psalms and why he translated it the way he did and how much Bono really appreciates it. But Eugene says primary place is the workplace. And one of the reasons is that we take our whole person to work. Uh, we don't just take our bodies. We don't just take our brains. We actually go as people to work, whole persons. We don't, we can't, we can attempt to do this, separate our spiritual life from our work life. We can attempt to separate Sunday and Monday. We can do it. But actually, the whole person goes to work. Henry Ford, as you know, was the inventor of mass-produced automobiles. He said, you can have my cars in any color you want, provide it's black. <laughs> but he said famously, why is it that I always get the whole person when all I want is just a pair of hands? We do take our whole persons to work. Now, the idea of soul is majorly misunderstood, largely from the Greek world, which was like a kind of fog that surrounded the early church, the beginning birth primitive church, a fog, a philosophical fog, if you like, a way of thinking, a worldview fog that influenced the people uh, of God to think that inside our evil body is a precious, immortal soul that is eternal. The body is temporal, but the soul is eternal. The body is evil. You say, yeah, a lot of Christians I know really think that, that the body is, it's a problem. The body is evil, but the soul is good, okay? And ministering to the soul is an eternal matter. Ministering to the body and bodily life, I've just come from 300 nurses. <laughs> they were ministering to persons, not just to bodies, but nevertheless. Ministering to the body is of only temporal significance. That's how people think. Now, you are all so young, and I am so old. You would not know what a flannel graph is. Anybody here know what a flannel graph is? See? You know, you were just born too late, except for Zanette. Zanette is ancient. But before there was overhead projectors, do you know what that is, an overhead projector? Yeah, you do. Before there were data projectors, next year I won't come, but there'll be a hologram here of me, okay? But before there was overhead projectors, there was flanographs. Flanograph was simply a board with cloth on it, and you had figures with cloth backing, and they'd stick if you put it on the flanograph, okay? Now, I was a Sunday school dropout at 11 years of age. I didn't go to Sunday school after 11. And I can't remember anything my Sunday school teacher taught me except a lie. Isn't that awful? Wouldn't you 
you know, when you get to heaven, oh my goodness, if I ever meet her, just think, I have to say, I'm sorry, but everything I can remember is a lie. <laughs> Not terrible, eh? The only thing I can remember is a lie. She put this figure up on the flannel graph of a human being, and she said, that's you. I thought, oh, that's me, okay. Then she put a big red heart there, and she said, you got a heart. I thought, that's nice, I got a heart. Then she took something the shape of a kidney, and it was gray, and she put it right here. You got a soul. I thought, wow, I got a soul. You know? So we sing, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. But you know, in contrast to the Greek dualism of body and soul is biblical anthropology, which means understanding of the human person. It's a revealed understanding of the human person, which is under the older covenant that the nefesh lev soul does not refer to a kind of spiritual part of the person that is disconnected from bodily life, but is the longing person, the longing person, longing for relationship with God, longing for heaven. And so, instead of this being an organ in the body, it's the person with the capacity and desire to long for God. Okay? And the New Testament assumed the old and maintained that essential unity of the human person so that the New Testament hope is not the immortality of the soul, but the resurrection of the body, the person. So my future is not to be a disembodied soul floating around in heaven, but to be a fully resurrected person with hair in the new heaven and the new earth. I always like to tell people that, you know, in the West, everybody calls me Paul, first name. But in Asia and in Africa, it's always Stevens because I have a corporate identity. And, of course, Asia and Africa are much more communalism, whereas the West is very individualistic. And my wife in Africa was given a tribal name, the wife of the bald one. <laughs> so when you have supper with her tonight, so that you can say, oh, it's so good to see you, wife of the bald one. <laughs> but it's a communal identity, okay? But my future is not to be a soul in heaven. I'm not going to heaven. But I'm a fully resurrected person in a renewed New heaven and new earth. Renewed earth, renewed heaven. So our hope is the resurrection of the body, not the immortality of the soul. This is fantastic. This means that when you touch a person's body, you're actually touching their person. It would revolutionize sexual behavior if people realize you never have sex with a body, but with a person. And women understand that even better than men. And when you touch people in terms of their soul, you're touching the person. So when I go back today and see my wife and hug her, I'm not hugging her body. I'm hugging her person. It revolutionizes even how we treat people, I think, to see that in fact, where persons are unified with body, soul, spirit, are just dimensions of our personhood. They're not organs in our person. And that's why Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2 said, present your whole bodily life to God as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. This is working and relating sexuality and money and everything about your bodily life presented to God as a living sacrifice 
which is your spiritual worship. So we take our whole person to work. Secondly, we can discover how the presence and power of the triune God and the inseminating effect of Scripture. I love the passage in Peter, which in the Latin Vulgate, you are born again, it says, you are in by the semen, the sperm of the Word of God. Oh, goodness. It's the sperm of the Word of God. It's inseminating Word of God. It can provide resources for the integration of faith and work. And we can find ways of preparing ourselves for work. Uh, I call this the mixed life, being uh, Martha sometimes and Mary other times. Engaged in work like Martha and yet withdrawing uh, like Mary did. Uh, it's called the mixed life. And actually we need to be, as Thomas Green, Roman Catholic priest here in Manila, once said, the authentic Christian has a hyphenated name. Mary hyphen Martha. We need both. Okay? But also how in the context of our work we can actually have some disciplines that point us in the direction of God. Uh, prayer is an obvious one. Like uh, just even to shoot a prayer before you meet a client, before you do a new task, before you have to make a decision. God, I can't do this unless you help me. I became a Christian at 18 years of age. Let me tell you a little bit about it because it's kind of interesting, I think, maybe to you. Uh, at 16, I was baptized uh, in a Baptist church, but I wasn't a Christian. Now, I don't know whether that rings a bell, but in a Baptist church, we believe in believer's baptism, which means it's believers that should be baptized, not unbelievers. Oh, boy, uh, now I know I'm in trouble. So anyway... I was not a believer, but I was baptized. And I was sitting at the back of the church at 18, 17 years of age, actually. And uh, I found the services really boring. So I'm a design and build person, and I was spending my time designing and building things. I built boats, I built furniture, I built all kinds of stuff. And I would make drawings and, and material lists and so on. But my eye caught the newsletter of the church. He said, young people meet at 7 p.m. Sunday. I thought, I've never been to a youth meeting. I'm going to try it. So I went to the back of the church, and it was in the worst room, not a beautiful room like this. It was dark, no windows, steam pipes, dirty, and there were 10 people sitting in a circle. They had long, fat, sad faces. And I said, hi, I'm Paul Stevens, and I'm here to join your group. They said, that's too bad. I said, why is it too bad? They said, it's our last meeting. I said, why is it your last meeting? They said, we can't find anybody to be president. Then they looked at me. They said, if you're willing to be president, we'll keep meeting. I said, it, ooh, 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 sorry. I said it's a deal. So I took over the group on my first meeting. Now, I still wasn't a Christian, but uh, I thought, this is a church group. Boy, they should be studying the Bible and praying. So I organized Bible studies and prayer meetings, including a prayer retreat. And at the prayer retreat, I hired a pastor to speak. And the only thing I can remember saying was a lie. He said, God called me to be a missionary at 16. I refused to go. God made it so I could never go. I had a motorcycle accident. My left leg was mangled. I'm lame. No mission board will take me. I'm doomed to do God's second best to be a pastor. And I thought, oh boy. But you know, I became a Christian that night. So never despair. God can use even a donkey if you know the Bible. And so I became a Christian that night. And uh, next morning I woke up. I said, your president got saved last night. <laughs> and so, anyway, I discovered that very quickly 
that it's possible to actually shoot a prayer to God almost any time without becoming inefficient and distracted in your work. I uh, actually, eight days later, went to university. It was just before I went to university. I was in a men's residence, and somebody discovered that there was a new Christian. He said, we meet every night for Bible reading and prayer for half an hour after supper. Would you like to join us? And I said, yes. So I had daily fellowship. And somebody gave me the little book, The Practice of the Presence of God, by Brother Lawrence. Lovely little book. Probably one of the most important in my life. And he was in the kitchen making meals, and the brothers were upstairs praying, chanting, and singing. But he was down there with a clatter of pots and pans. And they would come downstairs and say, Lawrence, how come you seem to know the Lord so well, but you're working, and we're upstairs praying, but we don't, we don't know him like you. He said, I just go to God through everything I do. My greatest business does not divert me from God. Before I do something, I say, Lord, I can't do this unless you help me. And when I make a mistake, I said, God, I'm always going to do this till you men what's amiss in my life. Even while we're working, we can actually be seeking God. And I have a friend who uh, developed some 3D software for analyzing MRIs so that instead of having black, white, and shades of gray on an, an image, you have mountains and valleys, and you're able to diagnose the actual perimeter of tumors much more effectively. And he's been going to medical directors of hospitals with this software, and he keeps a stone in his pocket to remind him that God's with him, he's with God while he's doing that. But then work itself is a kind of spiritual discipline. So we can reconcile the demands of the soul with the demands of business. The demands of business are product productivity, inventiveness and creativity, trust, coordination, evaluation, analysis, accountability, and teamwork. The demands of the soul are worship, wholeness, peace, community, Prayer, forgiveness, hope, integration, communion, discernment, and integration. And if you, this is something you might want to do when you get these PowerPoints, see if you can draw a line between the demands of the soul and the demands of business. And I think you'll find, not in every case, but you can in many, many cases draw a line between the demands of the soul and the demands of business. In other words, the work itself can become an arena of spiritual growth. You can actually draw a line between the left side and the right side. So uh, in England, London, we were there in September, uh, called the, this is the atheist bus. Probably there's no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. You know, the atheists are advertising even more effectively even than many Christians. But let me ask you the question. What actual difference to your work does it make that there's a God? I had an interesting discussion with a taxi driver coming here this morning. He didn't know, by the way, where uh, Timog Road was. He had to find that. It's bad, I know. Um, he had to find it on the internet to figure where Timog was. And then, of course, I messed up with Scout Madrinen because I, he put it in as I-A-N at the end. And it's A-N, not I-N. It's Madrinen, not Madrinian, right? We got here. In case you didn't know it, I'm here. This is really me. This is not a hologram. And uh, I'm glad to be here, and he helped a great deal. But I had a very interesting discussion with him on what difference faith makes to his own work as a taxi driver. And that recognizing that the workplace itself is an arena of spiritual growth and that all the issues and questions that get raised while we work uh, lead us to seek 
a deeper integration of faith and work, like failing. I sent an email last night to a very, very dear friend who's failing right now. He's just been turned down about four times uh, by possibilities. And he feels like a failure. But, oh, that experience itself is such an opening for growing spiritually. Relationships with co-workers. Oh, man. I, you know, I had a falling out with a co-worker. I mean, it was so bad. Oh, I swore at him. A stuff that came out of my mouth. I didn't think I could say those words. They were awful. I, I just, it was terrible. He was just destroyed by it. He thought I was his best friend. And for me to blast off at him, he ended up resigning, got out of it. And it's taken almost a year, a long time ago, but it took a year to be really reconciled. And I love him, but I won't work with him again. And I learned something very, very important about me and about my relationship with people and my relationship with God. Those hard experiences are the best but it doesn't feel like it at the time feels like the worst but it's the best if we process it and then love and profit contentment, ambition, push, push, push what is it about me that I always want this new situation or some kind of advancement Uh, contentment why am I so discontent and Work that lasts and work that doesn't last. These are all kinds of issues in daily work that kind of invite us Godward. Now, what about spirituality? It's very difficult to define. Most professors of spiritual theology refuse to define it. I am stupid enough to try. But I'm going to use a definition from the South American uh, professor... His name is Segundo Galilea, and it's a really good definition. All spirituality, he says, springs from this fundamental fact of a God who loved us first. Whoa. I thought spirituality was pushing yourself up to get to God. No, sir. It's God loving us and seeking us. If Christian spirituality is before all else an initiative by and a gift from God who loved us and seeked us. Spirituality is our recognition and response with all that entails to this love of God that desires to humanize, make us more human and sanctify us. This path of spirituality is a process. And if you're American, you'd say process. Concrete, but never finished, by which we identify ourselves with God's plan for creation. And because this plan is essentially the kingdom of God, and it's justice, oh, you know, what was the gospel Jesus preached? It was not the gospel of soul salvation, folks. Read it. First message in the Bible. Repent, for the kingdom of God's right here. Last message of Jesus on earth, talking to the disciples about the kingdom of God. And because this plan is the kingdom of God and its justice and holiness, spirituality is identification with the will of God in bringing his kingdom to us and to others. Segundo Galilee. I tried to define work, as I did earlier, as energy expended purposefully. Now, John Stott is wonderful, the late John Stott, wonderful. He says, work is energy expended purposefully that brings glory to God and benefits one's neighbor, whether seen or unseen. Now, I don't believe in speaking to dead people, but if I had a chance, I'd say, Brother John, that's good work. Bad work does not glorify God. 
and doesn't benefit your neighbor, hurts your neighbor. Okay? But good work glorifies God and benefits your neighbor. Whenever I have to give blood for a test, you know how, I, I mean, I'm sure you've all experienced it. They put this tourniquet on and, and they put in a needle and they take out vial after vial after vial of blood. Do you watch why they take out all your blood? I can't. But I say to the technician, I say, you know, what you're doing is a practical way of loving your neighbor. And once she said to me, I know, this is where diagnosis starts. It will lead probably to a surgery in some cases, medication. It's a practical way of loving my neighbor. Benefits your neighbor. Good work does that. But works hard in the world today. Most uh, Christians in business, uh, I'm afraid they do separate faith and work. And the church doesn't honor work. The church honors missionaries. It honors pastors. It honors what they call saints. But it doesn't honor business people. It honors people that are doing the Lord's work. So-called. When somebody tells me they're leaving business and going into the Lord's work, I always say, what were you doing before? Because people who are doing creative work are entering into God's creativity. People are sustaining things like homemakers and doing chores and politics and systems work. They're entering into God's sustaining work. Folks that are fixing things and transforming like technicians and, and doctors and lawyers and so on, they're doing, entering into God's redemptive work. And people in the media uh, and journalists and folks that are educators pointing where things are going and trying to lead people towards maturity, they're entering into God's consummating work. So, you know, when somebody says they're leaving business to go into the Lord's work, I always try to show them how they were doing the Lord's work before. But it's okay if God really leads you to go from one kind of Lord's work to another kind of Lord's work. That's okay. That's good. Fine. But don't think you're going from part-time to full-time. Because there's no part-time option for followers of Jesus. And then there's a huge gap between business profit and compassion. And boy, uh, I'm in business right now. I'm a director of a small company. And uh, I am, have been involved in the business for quite a few years. And uh, it's an issue, isn't it? The struggle between profit, uh, that we need to make a profit to survive... At the same time, you know, there are pulls, compassion. Um, when we had a construction business, we were hiring some people that had just come out of prison. And um, they weren't that good working because they hadn't done much work for a long, long time. But they could be taught and trained, but we didn't make a lot of money on them. So you have to... You know, this is a wrestle. This is an issue. And there is tough stuff out there in the work world, everywhere. Big stuff. There's very little downtime in the nature of work today. Now, in Canada, it's now illegal to talk on your cell phone while you're driving. Is it illegal here? But people do it, don't they? They do it. In fact, I saw a sign this morning, no texting while you're driving. And Manila is the texting capital of the world. It's wonderful, isn't it? And it's amazing. But still, total engagement. You know, you could be in the middle of your prayer and it goes beep. See, I don't even have my smartphone here. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So away you go. Total engagement. It's very difficult. And even change is changing. The rate of change. Wow. And the nature of change, it's so, it's not easy, it's hard. And stress levels are epidemic. And I have a friend who's uh, had a number of really serious dental issues in the last two months. And he says, I don't experience stress. But his body said, you do. You do. And he discovered that all of his dental symptoms were a result of stress. 
and it's, it has an effect. We struggle with work-life balance. You know, I often ask people, when I get the chance, what's the biggest issue in your life, in your work life? And they would say, almost always, work-life balance. Work seems to be all-consuming. I don't have time for family. I don't have time for my prayers. I have time for the church, so on. And partly because of outsourcing. Outsourcing to the Philippines <laughs> with call centers and, outs- and, and global competition. You know? It's incredible what's happening. And you know it, and we know it everywhere else in the world, too. My, uh, I'm a photographer, and my Nikon, I have a very big Nikon film camera, Do you know what film is? Are you old enough to know uh, what film is? You do know, okay. Stolen in Spain. So I thought, this is my chance to move to digital. So I got a really, really good Nikon uh, single lens reflex. I thought, oh, Japanese technology. And then I read, after I bought it, I read the the body said, made in Thailand. I thought, oh, I thought this was Nikon, you know. But then I bought one of these really great lenses, 24 to 200. It's all in one zoom lens, really. The lens is worth more than the camera. And so I bought that. I said, well, this time I've got Japanese technology made in China. (laughs) And then there's a little clicker for the remote. I thought, well, that's that's made in Japan. No, that's made in China, too. So... Here we have it. That's part of the stress. It's part of the struggle we have, okay? Two approaches to spirituality. One is at the edge. You've got God at the top. Then you have the church, retreats, evangelism, drawing. But down here you've got all the things that make up everyday life. You've got recreation, finance, entertainment, charitable, ministry, social, work, all the rest of the family, okay? But what we want is spirituality at the center of everything. God at the center of everything. Now, on work-life balance, some people talk about it using the image or metaphor of, of a tightrope, balance, the balanced life. Doesn't that sound nice? Balanced life. How many people here have, I won't look, how many people feel they have a balanced life. I don't okay. But I, my balance is not very good. I've, I've had um, what's called many years disease, which affects your inner ears. So I don't go up on ladders now. And I can't drink caffeine, because if I have too much salt or caffeine, I start to spin. Okay, so I have to be very careful. I'm alive. And I'm grateful to be alive but I have to watch the balance. But I do know this about walking a tightrope. If you are one inch off, you're dead meat. It's very tricky to stay on that tightrope, okay? So balance. Can you live a balanced life? You know, just everything perfectly apportioned. Just going to move from this to that. It's just wonderful, isn't it, if you could live a balanced life? Have you ever noticed that in the Gospels, most of the ministry of Jesus happened in interruptions? He was on his way to heal a little girl, and a woman who had a flow of blood grabbed hold of him, and he felt virtue, energy coming out of his person. He stopped and healed the person, talked to her. But most of his ministry was in the interruptions. He didn't live a balanced life, okay? But that's one metaphor. Here's another. Anybody here who's a bookkeeper or an accountant? Nobody. Anybody here has any money? No, nobody's got any money. Anybody who wants to talk about money? Sinat, put your hand up. (laughs) But the text under this cartoon is, you seem to have the qualifications we're looking for in a bookkeeper. It's a juggler, you know? (laughs) I won't tell you what country of the world, but somebody in business there told me, we have three sets of books. One for the government, one for the owner, and one for everybody else. (laughs) They don't say the same things. (laughs) 
juggling the accounts, okay? Now, I have watched jugglers. I'm not a juggler. I've watched them, you know? It's really beautiful. But I, the secret is you must not let the, all the balls come down at the same time. One at a time. You can do it. But if they all come down at once, you're dead meat. But that's what happens in life. All the balls come down at once, right? So I don't think that's a, a particularly good image of how we can live healthily and wholly. So a Canadian uh, business consultant, his name is John Della Costa, said, the truth is balance is bunk. It's an unattainable pipe dream. Quest for balance between work and life, as we've come to think of it, isn't just a losing proposition, it's hurtful, a destructive one. Okay. So how do we find God in the middle of life? Many people say, have a list of priorities. A list. Now, I'm not going to tell you which country the CEO of McDonald's said, my priorities are Sunday, God first, family second, work third. On Monday, work first, family second, and God third. Thank God for an honest person. That's how a lot of people live. I don't think priorities work. I think a better way is to think of a web of priorities. That means these are all important. They are all important. Work is important. Yes. Family is important. The people of God and ministry, important. Ongoing learning. That's very important. And recreation, refreshment, renewal, very important. So a web of priorities. I've got lots of arrows going between these because there's tension all the time between these different priorities in our lives. Where's God? Right in the center of everything. Right in the center of everything. Not top of the list but in the center of everything. First in work, first in family, first in ministry, first in learning, first in rest and recreation. So how do we develop a kingdom spirituality? Daily Sabbath, we need it every day, prayer and crawling through scripture. Those are the two biggies. There's other things we could do, but reading the Bible and praying Taking a few minutes before you start your day. Zanette knows that I took a very early cab this morning because I had no idea with what the traffic was going to be. And I had time to actually go down to a coffee shop. But my reason wasn't that I really wanted a cup of coffee. So I wanted some time to pray and start the day that way. Because I just got up, shaved, had a quick bite to eat, and then found a taxi. We really need this every day. We need a little Sabbath. It could be 15 minutes, could be half an hour, could be 45 minutes. I know some people take two hours, and I just admire them so much, but they're also, they don't work very hard. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. So, uh, you know, but I think we need this. Uh, the late... Dallas Willard said spiritual disciplines is when the dust of history is blown away, nothing other than an activity undertaken to bring us into more effective cooperation with Christ and his kingdom. Spiritual disciplines, uh, you could call them exercises onto godliness, are activities undertaken to make us capable of moving more of his life and power, of receiving more of his life and power without harm to ourselves or others. Um, I kind of like to think of it as this way. You remember the story in John chapter 11 of the healing and raising of Lazarus? 
And it's a great story, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, real close friends of Jesus. And uh, Lazarus is dead in the tomb. And the friends couldn't do what Jesus did, which is to raise him from the dead. But they could do something. They could move the stone aside so that Jesus could speak the life-giving word to that dead man. That's what spiritual disciplines are. Moving the stones aside so that God can fight us freshly. I've tried to research in Scripture what are the practices mandated by the Bible. And uh, I may not have a complete list, but this is what I've come up with. Prayer seems to be essential. Pray all the time without ceasing. The Lord's Supper, that's a practice that we're asked to do. Hospitality, receiving people, making them feel welcome, that's required. Fellowship, not an option. Uh, this week when I was teaching, I said, I hope you won't mind my repeating it. Mind you, it's not repeated for you. But I think we make a great mistake when we invite people to join the church. I don't think that's the gospel at all. The gospel is to join God. We get adopted into the family life of Father, Son, and Spirit. As soon as we get adopted, you know, as John in his letter said, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Whoa, oh, 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 that's amazing. Or John 1, 12, as many as received him who believed in his name, to them he gave the power to become workaholics for Jesus and the church. No, it doesn't say that at all. For them he gave the power to become children of God. Now, as soon as you become children of God, you've got brothers and sisters. And as Ernest Best, who is the best theologian on the church, particularly the body of Christ, said, there are no individual Christians. We're born into the family. Fellowship. And then Sabbath. I'll come back to that. Mutual service. We have to do that. Mutual service. Mutual confession. Oh boy, that's a biggie. Mutual submission. That's even bigger. And thanksgiving. Gratitude. You know, one of the earlier English authors on spirituality was Francis Schaeffer. He said, the two tests of the spiritual life, first in regard to God, I'm to love God enough to be contented. Oh, good. Thanksgiving, gratitude is central to that. Not poor me, but thank you, God. Thank you. I'm to love God enough to be content. And the second test is to love our neighbor enough not to covet. Coveting is not just envy for money, but for everything. Thanksgiving is central to that. When I started reading Philippians chapter 4, where Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in plenty or in want. I thought, I think I've learned the secret of being discontent. So I better find out how to be content. And I read down in the passage, and it says, by prayer, all kinds of prayer, with thanksgiving. Oh, okay. That's how you become content. And then crawling through scripture, mulling, brooding, musing, chewing. Uh, you know, there's some beautiful analogies out of the Hebrew words for meditation. One of them is, uh, a lion has its play, prey, excuse me, has its prey in its mouth, and it's kind of savoring it. You know? Or the, the cow that chews the cud. You know, it's that kind of chewing on, meditating, imbibing, making it your own. Now, I'll tell you what I do. And it's not something you have to do, but um, I read every morning a psalm. I'm currently at Psalm 90. So I've got it. You can't afford to do this if you can't afford a yellow post-it. Okay? But if you can afford one of these, you can be holy. 
okay. So I put, I put a little yellow post-it in, 89, and the morning comes along. Oh, it's 90 today, so I read that. Then I read one chapter from the Old Testament. Boy, it's heavy going, but here we are. Ezekiel 36. That's where I am. Ezekiel 36. And then I read a chapter from the New Testament. Guess where I am? Revelation chapter 3. Now, what does this tell you? There's 365 days in the year. And you get to read the Psalms twice a year. And the New Testament twice a year. And it takes you more than a year to get through the Old Testament. I've done this for 30 years. So I'm constantly washing my mind and heart in the Word of God. We need a daily Sabbath. We need a weekly Sabbath. As William Deal, in his book, Thank God It's Monday, puts it, biggest gap between our confessed theology of Sunday, that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works, and our experience of Monday is works righteousness. Our actions betray a belief that our identity and worth are based entirely on what we do and how well we do it. Sabbath, I think, from Scripture, is based on three things. Prayer and lots and lots of Scripture about communion with God. Peacemaking or bringing wholeness. Now, in Mark chapter 2, we see Jesus teaches about Sabbath, but in that context, he healed the man with the withered arm, and he also harvested some grain because he was hungry and his disciples were. And the Pharisees said, how come you do all your miracles on Sabbath? You've got six other days to do it. Why did he do it? To show that Sabbath brings wholeness, shalom, peacemaking. And there's a playfulness in Sabbath as well. Um, We had, and thanks so much for one of your number, that arranged for a Philippine fiesta at the conference that I just came from yesterday on Wednesday night. It was wonderful. But the festivals of Israel were fun. They were playful. They really were enjoyable. And I think we're to enjoy Sabbath. And uh, nobody's, uh, no pastor that I know of would dare preach on Deuteronomy 14, verse 26. Okay? This is for you, Zanette. But if you are a long ways from Jerusalem and want to go to the festival, and you can't bring your sheep and your birds to the festival because it's so far, convert them to money, and when you get to Jerusalem... Buy wine and good food and have a party. Now, no pastor wants to preach that sermon. Nobody does, okay? But it's there in the Bible. Playfulness of Sabbath. Prayer, peacemaking. Prayer, that personal, communal prayer, worship, celebration. Peacemaking, renewal, recreation, creativity. I love working with photography. I I shouldn't use the word working with photography. It's playing, actually, and it's creative on on Sunday, which I try to keep Sunday. And play is feasting and enjoying and leisure. And Eugene Peterson says, if you can't afford to take one day a week for rest, you are taking yourself too seriously. And then retreats, solitude, twice a year or once a year uh, to actually go somewhere Uh, For a couple of days, pray, review your priorities, recommune with God, and do that. It's very important. Separated from the infrastructure of daily life, Henry Nouwen said, we're confronted with ourselves. Solitude is a place of great struggle against the compulsions of the false self and our encounter with the living and loving God who offers himself as a substance of that new self. Are we need meters. We just have to meet needs. Or are we addicted to impressing others by our performance? Needing always to be in control. Some of these are my questions. Praying. Are we playing a role? The desert, whether it's a retreat center or I know somebody who goes to a mall and uh, where nobody knows him and he just window shops. 
But he's praying. It's a kind of a little desert for him. But it was for Israel a place where God wooed. God wooed or courted them. Therefore, I'm going to lure her, lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. The Hebrew is so beautiful. It's a davar lev. Uh, speak to the heart of. I'm going to speak to the heart of Israel. So Archbishop Hume said once, no person can afford to live in the marketplace who doesn't also live in the desert. And then people, to be, to have people who are helpful to us, co-conspirators for health. Now, um, my website, which is our Paul Stevens dot com. If you send an email to Paul at Paul Stevens dot com, it goes to a real estate agent in the United States. And so I have a student who will write and say, I'm depressed thinking of taking my life. And it goes to him. And he says, I'm sorry I can't help you, but if you have a house to sell, I can do it. So it's an R P A U L S T E V E N S dot com. But if you look at the bottom, my accountability group, the names of the people that I meet with and who ask me, how much money are you making? What are you doing with it? What's your relationship with your wife like? How do you relate to women? What are the issues you're facing in your life right now? How's your relationship with God? I'm accountable to these people. And it's very, very helpful to us. I started that when I heard Chuck Swindoll, who's a pretty famous American preacher. I've only heard him speak once. I don't know whether anything else he said, but he did say this. There is not a single Christian leader in North America that has fallen, and lots have fallen. There's not a single Christian leader who has fallen who had an accountability group. All the leaders that fell had followers. But no accountability group. So the authentic disciple of Jesus, even in a cloistered community, has the hyphenated name Mary hyphen Martha. Dalla Costa, whom I mentioned earlier, as fully divine, fully human, Jesus invites us to discipleship premised on Judaic, what are usually mind-blowing contrasts, ordering earth as if it were heaven, participating in community as if it were Holy Eucharist, living in the moment as if it were of eternal significance. Thank you.